So this is about the seeking energy and knowing what you want. So I thought for this afternoon's session, I used to give people notepads and pencils so they could um, write these things down. But I think it's better maybe if you do it on your phone for the environment. If we start getting into all of us, I'm bad. I want to print things out all the time, but do things on our phone. Um, so if you write down for this afternoon session, a couple, maybe three things that you want in that moment when you're thinking about it. See if you can recognize three things you want. That could be big things like, I want a new house. It could be, I want this person to give me attention. It could be, I want to feel better about myself. I want this, I want that. It can be anything. Three things you want, so to be able to name them in that moment. And it might be when you come to the session this afternoon that it's changed and you don't want that anymore. But just go with what you want in that moment. Three things. And then you can also name three things you do not want as well. And this is just an exercise to, to see if you can recognize it and try not to be too mental about it. Try to see if you can put, if you can ask the question and put your attention in the body and see if an, an answer naturally comes when your attention's in the body. You can even move it to the heart area and then to the base chakra or the stomach chakra, solar plexus, and just see what is it that I want. So this identification arises at a young age, but it's not very intense when you're younger. So it most probably arises at about two or three years old, the identification with being the character, but it kind of gets stronger through time. So it's not so, so strong when you're say six years old and you're playing outside with your friends you kind of forget about yourself and forget who you are in the world, but it's beginning. And everybody's childhood is different. So if you had a very difficult childhood, then you might not be able to relate to what I'm saying. But I remember feeling so free and connected as a child. Like I remember, I even feel like I remember prior to becoming identified with my name and my form, But I certainly remember playing with my friends and being totally lost in the wonder of being. There was nowhere else I wanted to be in the world. Everything was complete in that moment. I was just playing. I didn't recognize who I was on the sense that I didn't know I was everything. I was just lost in everything. So I was more like an animal. Like, like Khaleesi or the birds. I wasn't able to name or to recognize separation and non-separation, but I was totally complete and totally involved in what I was doing. And I think that everyone can recognize this, that childlike innocence, or most people, if you had a really, really tra big, big trauma and very difficult first few years in your life, then maybe you can't remember that because there was too much pain. And that's okay, that doesn't mean that you're less likely to understand what I'm saying. It's just maybe a good thing actually. It might be something which makes you hear this subject more deeply to really identify what suffering is. So don't listen to that as a bad thing, but I'm just trying to show you the identification process. <clears throat> And so most people can feel that as they get older and older, 
they have more and more problems and they feel more and more contracted. So when you were a child, you had an innocence about you. You didn't think about where your food was coming from, what job you'd have next week, especially before you started school. There was just an immediacy, an intimacy with what was happening. And your routines, like we used to go swimming with my dad on a Saturday afternoon. And I used to love the routine of, the whole routine of it, of going swimming, of going into the pool, the smells, the playing with my brother, the arguing with my brother, getting changed. My dad pretending he was a shark in the swimming pool, chasing me. Then when they brought the floats out, they bring, bring the floats out in the pool. I used to go for, for like half an hour every like couple of hours and the kids were all like, Wah! the floats. <laughs> and then we used to go home and my mom had made us sandwiches. And then we'd sit and watch the A-team eating our sandwiches. <laughs> and I just, or we'd watch MacGyver. I don't know if you remember that. My brother was MacGyver and I was Mackenzie. MacGyver's helper, it's always the way with a bigger brother. <laughs> and it was just heaven. There was no place I wanted to be but there. If your parents could really know that, because when you're the parents, you are normally got the seeking energy, but how much bliss that child was experiencing to be totally looked after in that way, and the child doesn't know how many dangers it's had that day when it was swimming running across, I don't know how many things this had to fix. Like I used to, I think I was a child that used to have a lot of poo-poo accidents in the pool, so my poor parents had to quickly clean that up before anyone noticed. I think there was maybe lots of traumas my parents were going through and I was just like, wow. <laughs> I can remember like the taste of the sandwiches, the ham and cucumber sandwiches in brown bread. And we all have this, this, like, this memory, this intimacy with that. And then as we get older, we begin to go to school and we get older and things become more and more about future and who you were in the past. And it's the beginning of this tight energy which starts small but it gets tighter. So you go to school and there's a lot of fixation on what are you going to be when you're older? Which all of us experience a lot of stress around. It's like, oh God, everyone always asks that. What do you want to be when you're older? <laughs> and then you're told you have to get good grades. You have to perform well in school. And you have to sit quietly and do as you're told. And, and all of these things are fine. Like I teach Khaleesi all these things. Not to be in school and education, but I teach her to sit, to stay, to behave. That's not the problem, but it's the identification with it. Khaleesi doesn't believe by sitting that she'll get extra aliveness or extra beingness. <coughs> She sits, and even if she doesn't want to, she's in absolute bliss because she's home. Whereas the child begins to feel like it's done something wrong, that it's, it's guilty in some way, that it's lost something, that it's not going to be good enough, it's not going to achieve enough. Khaleesi doesn't worry about achieving with me. Let me just think about that. I don't think she worries about achievement. I can tell I stress her out a little bit with some of the rules, but she doesn't have any mental sense with that. She can't feel like she's failing because she doesn't know who she is. She can't sit there and think, I'm a failure, because who would she be? How would she imagine herself? She cannot see herself in the mirror, so she can't imagine herself as this black dog with pointy ears and a sticking up tail like a skunk. She has no idea. She can't imagine herself as a past action. 
She can't think, well, I'm the killer of chickens or I'm Lisa's dog. She just cannot imagine who she is. So she can't imagine that she's failed me. How would she imagine that? She can imagine, or not imagine, but she can feel the immediate pain of letting me down. Like she can feel, she feels pain when I'm angry with her. But she can't take that on as something about her. As soon as I stop doing it, she's forgotten like a fish. Some form in her body remembers because she has got some way to train herself. A fish can't be trained, I don't think. So she has some form of memory, but she can't think I'm guilty, I've done something wrong. Lisa's not gonna love me if I don't get it right. I'm not gonna be abandoned or left by myself. Whereas the child begins to imagine this. So the child begins to fail in school and it begins to worry about failing in school. It has an image of who it is, an image of this little girl or little boy in its head. And you're normally actually a little bit removed. You normally actually see it as a figure. You're not looking out, when you imagine yourself, you actually see yourself in some way, sometimes. Maybe you look through that person's eyes when you imagine, but it's often you see a figure in your imagination. You see the little Lisa or, or the little John or whoever. <coughs> and you see yourself and then you imagine that the teacher's gonna tell you off and you're gonna get in trouble and you're gonna end up in the, outside the classroom. And then, then that gets to a bigger abandonment, like it begins to, you begin to associate that with some form of death. So it becomes really important. If you get kicked out, it's sort of a form of dying. So you begin to seek to improve yourself in time. You think more about your homework, about getting it correct. Or you build up more resentment towards the teacher. And bit by bit, this person arises and more and more attention is put on that person. So the problems of the person become more pronounced. And some, by the time you're a teenager, sometimes you already feel quite uncomfortable with yourself. You're afraid of what your peers will think of you. You're afraid of sexuality relationships and all of it requires an image of you you can only do all these things imagine all these things with an image of you of who you are which is really I'm not suggesting that we get rid of this image fully of who we are on the human level but what happens in those years is that becomes solely who you are there's a forgetting of this infinite space that you are, this infinite possibility. And you become locked in just being this person that worries about themselves and worries about their appearance and tries to fix themselves and their life. And then, and then you get further and further in education system and then you begin to be worried about being kicked out of the education system and creating your life and your job. And who are you? And some people deal with that better. Some people have a stronger sense of who they are and what they want. And they tend to do better in society. They have more of a clear goal. And they have less fear and anxiety. It doesn't mean they're closer to home. It's just their personality structure. And they've got a fixation on what they want and a drive to what they want. And so they tend to be more successful. And those that aren't really sure who they are or what they want, they're like wanting to stay in the education system because they don't want to get to the moment of decision. I have to decide what I do and what I am. And so then by the time that happens, then that can be a big thing. I often notice, particularly, I work with a, a lot of people, but I've, heard, I've worked with a lot of young men, and I notice that this can be very overwhelming, this period of life of being kicked out of home, 
to creating your own place. It can be for a woman as well, but I just noticed with my work particularly that I've come across a lot of men where this has created a lot of anxiety and terror and feeling disempowered. If you're on the side of feeling very empowered and very strong, then it's easier that period. And that's the easy part of life. <laughs> then it begins to get harder and more complex because then you begin to build your own life and you have to begin to juggle a lot of things in order to survive in this society. Not all the time, but it tends to be for a lot of people. You begin to get a career and you begin to get money. And once you get money, then you've got to buy and look after things. So then you've got the house to look after, the things to look after, to polish and keep clean and make sure they're still there. And then you've got the money to juggle, the places to put the money. That's quite a lot. Then you've got the next step is the family. And then you have kids which become dependent on you for a period of years, dependent on the children of how long they need, need you. And that, that is then in a very intense life, not a bad life, it doesn't have to be a suffering life, but that's a very fast-paced life to live for a lot of Western people. Not all Western people, it's different for everyone, but this tends to be the general way of things. And when you're just identified with being that person, everything becomes super important. You want to be the best parent. You want to be the best employee. You want to have the best career, the best car, the best house because that's who you are. So how could you settle for something less than the best? If you believe that's who you are, that's very uncomfortable accepting other people to have more, other people to be better than you, to not be doing what you think is the right thing. The only way you can deal with all those things is to see that that is not who you are. That your happiness is not dependent on those things. Your happiness is not dependent on your children, on your partner, on your money, on your home, on your life expectancy, on your parents' behavior, on your friend's behavior, none of that is your freedom. That is the crazy wild journey of this life that's immensely fascinating, but it will go in waves. It will have all different colors to it. It has to. All different colors to it. But who you are and your happiness and your freedom is the consciousness and the I am. It's what's always present. All the other things will move and change. You'll never be able to keep them. You'll never be able to hold on to them. They change constantly. And to really appreciate them, you have to accept that that's their nature to really accept that's their nature. As you begin to see this on a human level, it will begin to change the way you think. It will begin to change your emotional body. It's not you that gets enlightened because you don't exist as such. You're not experiencing, you're not alive. It's consciousness and the I am that's alive. But it will have an effect 
on the way you see this world on the human level. And you will go through this process of becoming more and more in tune with your nature on the human level. And that has no end. On the human level, it has no end. You can become more and more aligned with it. And we don't know what that looks like. It looks like what it looks like. Your goal is not to try to behave like what you think it looks like. Your goal is to be as you are. And so that's a moment of neurosis because you think a spider's bitten you and it's gonna kill you. Or you think that your house is going to take off in the wild winds. Or that your partner's going to leave you for another person. Or if it's a moment of anger when you realize that someone's not being fair in business. Or you realize your dog just ate your dinner or as you turned your back, which you'd spent two hours clean cooking. <laughs> or that your child drew on the wall that you just painted white with matte paint, not satin. Or that your house just falls down. Or you finish building a house after 10 years and then a fire takes it. I actually know <laughs> another teacher that that happened to. He spent nine years building it and it was perfect and then a fire took it. It was massive as well. And it's like, ah, God, why? Oh, okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Eight years! <laughs> well, you're Jesus carrying the cross, the suffering of all of humanity, which is quite a lot. And you're carrying the cross and they're all throwing rocks at you. And then you have the moment, oh, Father, why did I forsake me? It can look like anything, you can't judge that. The only thing you can do on the human level is be authentic to what you are. And the way that you be authentic to what you are is to n understand what the human is, what you are. And that's a very personal thing. So wanting, wanting is an important part of this. So in the Buddhists, when I was with the Buddhist organization, for those that don't know, but I'm sure you do, I was a practicing Buddhist for, I don't know, five or six years, I can't remember now. And what it means to be a practicing Buddhist is they give you precepts and lots of books that you have to read and study groups and practices that you have to do. 
And when I was learning with the Buddhists, they taught me that the end of suffering was the end of craving. So each Buddhist group is different. Some call it desire. They call it different things. They taught me it was craving. The word was craving. And they taught me that's not desire. And that's not pleasure and pain. It's the end of craving. And craving is this craving for owning things, having things, getting things, this craving for completion in life. And I thought craving was quite a good word for it. So when I say wanting, knowing what you want, I don't mean craving. Enlightened or not enlightened, the human will always have wants. It's the way the human works. But we're very complicated because what we do on the human level is we kind of play this game of pretending we don't have wants in order to get what we want. So it's like we don't acknowledge what we want, even though we want something. Even to ourselves, we don't acknowledge what we want. And then we try to play the other to get what we want. But we're not really conscious of that. And this is very normal. And you'll be more balanced and peaceful if you actually understand what you want and you're not doing it unconsciously. Because I can assure you, you're doing it all the time. In every situation, you've got an agenda. Whether that agenda is to be appreciated by the other person, to give to the other person, to love the other person, there's always an agenda there. It's the same with, with animal, with the mammals. If we look at mammals that we, have, we think we've driven from if we believe in evolution. So if we look at mammals, mammals are the same. Khaleesi is not interested in me giving her a cuddle or a tickle when she's, when she, she's only, it's easier to say it this way, she's only interested in a cuddle and a tickle from me when she's hungry or bored. The rest of the time she's like, oh, come on, I have to do that again. But when she's hungry, she's very happy to cuddle. And when she's bored, she's very happy to cuddle. And maybe I'm the same with her. <laughs> if she comes to me, when I'm quite content and want nothing, I'm like, oh, okay, here you go, there's a tickle. <laughs> go get your bone. So I'm the same. I just put it on her to. <laughs> and I'm the same with every human being. I have an agenda. Now I'm not always aware of my agendas because sometimes it's too quick. A lot of the time, I'm quite aware of my agenda, or if someone calls me out on it, I can quite quickly admit what my agenda is. Whereas a lot of the time, we don't want to admit our agenda to ourselves or to the other. Because sometimes, I don't know why that is. I think partly we're not aware of our agenda and partly we don't want to know what our agenda is some of the time. We're afraid of it and we don't want to know what the other's agenda is. Maybe because we're looking for the unconditioned love in another human and in order to look for the unconditioned love in another human, we have to pretend a bit that humans don't, all humans don't have agendas. So we have to pretend that humans don't have agendas. I don't, I'm not exactly sure why we don't like to admit our agenda. Maybe we feel guilty about our agenda. But the, but the only reason you feel guilty about it is because you believe you're this human and that that's you. If you see it's not you, then you can admit your agenda a lot easier. And you can have all types of agenda. You can go into a conversation, and I can do this too. 
And you can want to make the other person feel guilty. We all do this. I might be the only one that's willing to admit it. But I'm sure you've even done it in this week. I know I've done it this week. I did it. I... Okay, I'll admit it then. It's just sometimes you don't want to talk too, when you're being recorded too much publicly. <laughs> so let me just work this out. I know it was there, but I wasn't really conscious, like really conscious of the, how to think about it. I could feel it was there. I can't quite name it. It's something along, I, I can feel that I do it. It's something along the lines of, of like using some form of guilt to get the other to serve me. Meaning, <clears throat> he's not looking, so that's okay. <laughs> So like some form of guilt when you're sort of like laying in bed and can't be bothered to move or you just want something. Like using some form of guilt in the terms of like a look. Like maybe they've been a little bit rude to you in a few sentences before and so now they feel obliged to go and get what you want. I used that this week, especially because I've been so busy. Like sometimes you have to use these things to get things done. Um, yeah. So maybe we, that the reason we don't want to admit that, which I would have admitted in the circumstance, and I quite happily admit, although it's sort of out of context here, so you're not aware of exactly what happened. Um, but it's, it's something we do all the time in our storytelling, in the way we present our stories to others, whether we present ourselves as poor or rich or vulnerable or strong, we're always using it to influence the other. But who here now thinks, I don't do that? Who wants to say to themselves, I don't do that? Like you don't have to say it to me, but it's in a way to not admit you do it keeps you more powerful and better than the other. To admit you're doing it brings you in the slums of being human. <laughs> You're like, oh yes, I'm human too. <laughs> um, we do this all the time in situations. Every situation you go in, you're playing. You're playing a game. You can deny that and be weak, or you can admit it and be strong. The denial of it will make you weak. Why that makes you weak is because 
you refuse to embrace what you are and you try to avoid what you are and pretend that you're a good person. You're not a bad person, but you're equally not a good person. You're as you are, which is very, you can't really judge what goodness and badness is. We can relatively. Like I, I know that I don't want to steal from someone. I don't want to trick someone. I don't want to lie to someone in general, but then that's what we name as bad. Like I don't want to do that because ethically it feels bad and it feels bad if I imagine how that person would feel. But I'm still an animal. And in every situation you're playing and I'm playing. And we can play in our communication, in our interactions. We want to be seen as the good person. We want to be seen as the sweet person, the generous person. And the more that you can get in touch with what you want and what you are and what you feel and what you're playing, the stronger you'll become and you'll actually become nicer. Because if my partner accused me of using guilt to get them to bring me some food or something, I would quite easily giggle and admit it. If I didn't want to admit that about myself, I would then attack them and I would argue with them and I would hate them and I would go on at them. But if I were just to like be like, oh yeah, I do, <laughs> and just admit it, then it's a lot easier and a lot stronger. But this makes you feel naked, right? Oh, I don't know, I'm projecting that onto you, but it makes you feel like, I've got to cover my private parts. <laughs> I've got to cover it. They can't know that I want something, that I'm trying to play this or that. I'm just good. I'm a good person. I love people. I'm kind. I don't want anything. That makes you very weak and that will make you, this area here, the solar plexus, very uncomfortable and this area here. Because you'll be denying what you want. You'll be <coughs> denying what you feel. And here, you'll not be embracing truly what you are. You'll be becoming a weak animal. You'll be in conflict. You'll be blaming and hating other people. You'll be rejecting other people. You'll be unconsciously blaming other people for not giving you what you want when you don't even know what you want. You're just so pissed off with them and you can't work out why you're so pissed off with them but they're really a bad person and it's really just because they haven't given you what you want. And if you know what you want, then you'll know why you're angry with them. If you don't know what you want, you won't know why you're angry with them and you'll keep going in circles of trying to get them to feel like they're an absolute asshole. <laughs> and the other person's like, oh, you don't know, you're, I know you're an asshole. And then they start and then you're like. <laughs> and you're trapped in this argument.
With Khaleesi, it's quite straightforward. <laughs> I know what I want and she knows what she wants. I want someone to look after like a child because I haven't had a child. And she wants me to give her chicken and walks. And that's that. <laughs> We're quite, that's our, that's our deal. So when she goes to bed, I get to, I go to her. It's a very, I get to do the very lazy parenthood. So when it's bedtime, I don't read her a story or do any of that. I give her four biscuits, I count out the biscuits, and then I pat her head. <laughs> I go, in your bed, and she's ecstatic to get into bed because she knows there's four biscuits coming. <laughs> she jumps into her bed, four biscuits. <laughs> very happy dog, and I'm very happy mother. <laughs> So we've got a very easy relationship, except I don't want her to be aggressive to other female dogs. We haven't come clear on this because she thinks that we need to be aggressive to female dogs. So we're still working on that one. But apart from that, we have a very peaceful relationship. We're very clear on what we want from each other. Humans, it's a bit more complicated, even for me, because my wants are so fickle. And one moment I want one thing, and then the next moment I want another thing. So it's like the, the, I'm a Gemini, so the, my partner is always a bit like, but you didn't want that a minute ago. I know. I want it now. <laughs> so I, like, I can still get stuck in arguments sometimes. And it, really, the best way out of it, if you can, is that you've got to both understand what you want and you've both got to be willing to surrender to that. It's difficult if just one person is surrendering to it and admitting what they want because then the other person will start playing the moral high ground and, oh, how could you want that? But if the other person is admitting what they want, then it can be a bit more peaceful. Humans is a lot more complicated, the relationships. What you want from another human most of the time is unconditional, lo unconditional love. <clears throat> That's what you actually want from the other. Most of the time is this unconditioned love. So the, the, the image of the Buddha, the image of the guru, the parent figure, this unconditioned love where they give you everything without wanting anything back. They just give to you endlessly and they don't want anything back. It's kind of funny when you really look at it. You're like, oh, that is what I want, yes. <laughs> I want this love which is totally unconditioned. <laughs> and you can't actually find that in the human. But you can find it in this moment. So you can experience it with another human if those two humans are present together. And this is really beautiful love. This divine presence that you can experience together. And it's really a beautiful way of being in relationship. But on the human level, you know, and when we go into the human world, and it's like, they want something, you want something. Okay, we come to some compromise. But in the moment when you touch them, when you look in their eyes, when you're talking, when you're laughing, when you're playing Titrus, then there is that intimacy, there is that unconditioned love. It's also what I love about Khaleesi, is we have this very simple relationship and there is this unconditioned love because there's this presence between us. 
So if you look for it in the other person's wants and desires behavior, it's going to be a disaster, which is where most people are looking for it. If you look at it in their absolute presence and being, then you'll see their divinity. You'll see them as everything you ever wanted. But only now, only here, you can only see that here, which is all the time, really, even in the arguments about who gets what and what color sofa you have. Even in that, there is their presence. And this is what you want. Your love for the other person is right here. Your love, your connection with humans is right here in this moment. You can understand why the shadow forms because we don't want to admit these things about ourselves, And the shadow is the pushing it into the unconscious, like pushing these elements into the unconscious of what you want, of what you don't want. And by pushing it into the unconscious, what it seems to do is it sort of highlights it and makes it worse and makes it more intense. It really is very strong to just embrace it. We can't ultimately know what good and bad is. It's a very complicated subject and we made up the premise of good and bad, so it's only relevant in the human world. But more than likely, if we did take a bird's eye view, if you can really embrace what you want, you'll more than likely be a kinder human. But I don't know that because it's a very complicated subject, good and bad. And it's okay to, to have a want, which is the want to please other people. That's okay. That's not a bad want. That's part of being a communal animal. Khaleesi wants to please me. Definitely. That's not a bad want. It makes us good in society if we all have this want. When you're in a group, sometimes that can be highlighted.
It's not a bad want to other help to help people. It's not a good want. It's just the way the, the body forms. Maybe there's moments where you don't want to help people and you don't want to please people. That's okay too. Actually, it wasn't guilt I was using, although I do use that in the past. It was sympathy, which maybe is worse. So now, in the next couple of hours, you can have the fun of writing out what you want. <laughs> and try to be as honest with that as you can. Like, don't do it quickly. Really, really go into that. What is it you want? And, you know, you have to accept the side in which we as humans would call bad. You have to accept that you can be the negative part as well as the positive part because that's life. If you look at nature, everything's circular. You can't be one without the other. So just really accept it and be okay with it. The more you accept it in yourself, the more you'll accept it in the other. And then eventually you'll see they were never your wants. And this is the beautiful part. They're the way life danced the appearance of you. And how else could it dance a person than through that?
if you really think about it, it creates the most amazing appearance. Our wants are the way our body moves. It's God's orchestra. It's God's conducting stick. They're not our enemy. The more in line you come with them, in a way you could say, on the human level, the closer the human is to that consciousness and that I am. It's not in the timeline, it's not in the abstract, it's just acting out God's will, innocently like a child. Okay, <laughs> thank you.